I'm so happy that I have Rachel Flat with me today. So she is the 2010 U.S. Ladies National Figure Skating Champion and Olympian and 2008 World Junior Champion. And currently she is in her third year of the Clinical Psychology Doctoral Program at UNC Chapel Hill. And her research interests are leveraging digital me mental health tools to prevent and treat psychiatric disorders in athletes with a primary focus on eating disorders. And she is also the athletic representative on the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee's Mental Health Task Force, US Figure Skating's Board of Directors, and US Figure Skating's Chair of Athletes Advisory Committee. So, so many great things that you're working on. Thank you for taking the time to chat with me today. Of course. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I keep a busy schedule. So, <laughs> but that's, I guess, part of being a grad student these days. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So tell me a little bit about how you first got started with figure skating. Yeah, so I grew up in Southern California and I was like a very typical Southern California kid involved in a number of different sports. Like I surfed, I played tennis, I did ballet, did gymnastics, like did everything under the sun and um, went to a local mall with my dad uh, when I was like almost four years old just to get my grandfather a birthday present. And they had underneath the food court, uh, like you could see into the rink below. And so I, you know, totally caught my eye. And instead of coming back with a gift for my grandpa, we came back with lesson tickets for me instead. So <laughs> that was how I started, but I was very much involved in sports for several years and really didn't start whittling it down to just skating until I was like, I don't know, maybe 12, 13 years old, um, but still obviously supplementing that with, you know, lots of off ice conditioning and dance and all that fun stuff. But yeah, that was, that was how I got started. And skating was really the one sport that, that really stuck over the years. Yeah. That's kind of like how my, um, I guess like upbringing was, I was doing like five different sports, you know, gymnastics, ballet, figure skating, and a lot of people specialize really early on. And, you know, research is now showing that the more you dabble in a little bit of things, the better off you're going to be in your long-term sport because you have more of that background to supplement mm -hmm. what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and intuitively, it makes a lot of sense because as you participate in other sports, like physically, you're developing different muscle groups and, you know, just having to problem solve in a different way too. You know, the way we solve in skating is very different than we would, you know, like in a team sport. So I think those types of interactions and those types of movements across different sports is really important early on. And, you know, plus it's so much fun. <laughs> like I love being involved in a lot of different sports and I just, I, you know, I had a blast. I love being an active kid. Yeah, absolutely. And then once you got started with like focusing on figure skating, what were the majority of the challenges that you felt like you were facing as an athlete? I think the challenges really changed over time. Because um, I think about when I was, you know, kind of at the, the developmental stage, but still competing like at a national level, you know, in my novice and junior years, I was you know, really just trying to figure out like what I wanted to, you know, what I wanted to accomplish in skating. And underneath it all, I really wanted to, you know, go to the Olympics and, and have some success on an international stage, but I didn't really know what that looked like. And so I think wrapping my head around those goals and figuring out what it takes to get to that level 
um, was something that I was grappling with pretty often at that stage. And it was also, you know, just, I was, I was a teenager balancing school and skating. And so that in and of itself was a major challenge. And I think that really carried me through the remainder of my career because I was in high school. I was in my senior year when I went to the Olympics and then I retired during my junior year at Stanford. And so you know, as you kind of go up through middle school, high school, college, it <laughs> the academic rigor tends to go up a little bit. And so that was something that I was having to navigate quite a bit. Um, but yeah, really when I was um, like at, at probably my peak, like 2008 through 11, 12, um, it really to figuring out like, who I was in skating and also like really balancing my priorities in life. Like skating and school were obviously two of the top priorities, but I was also a teenager and I wanted to do other things and, you know, go out with friends. And, and so, you know, navigating those changes and navigating like growing up into an adult and having to advocate for myself, like that was really the period that, that was starting to come into play. And I think it was emphasized even more um, during the last few years of, of my competition skating or competitive skating and then of course uh, you know when I was leading into retirement that in and of itself was a totally different <laughs> package um, that brought up a lot of different emotions and I think I was completely unprepared for that to be honest and um, took me a couple years to really get back on my feet and, and figure out what I was going to do with the rest of my life so challenges changed over time um and i you know i think having to be flexible with with working through that both as you know a young person and as my like as my family kind of observed that you know they were trying to be supportive my peers were trying to be supportive as we were all kind of going through similar things um so it was nice to have those support systems in place during those those changes but yeah, just a lot of different things kind of come at you as you <laughs> go through elite sports. That's that's really the too long didn't read uh, takeaway of that. Yeah, it's so interesting as like an athlete that you can retire and you're still like in your early <laughs> mid twenties, and then you're like, well, now what do I do for the rest of my life? It's not like your typical, you know, retire 60, 70 and like you're just set to go. So I think that's why it's really important to like continue to go to school and have like those outside sources of friends, even though it can be really overwhelming at times. And I know my like final exams always fell at the same time as nationals. And it was so frustrating because I was just like, I can't study, I can't take them. So I'd have to come back afterwards and like take it in the library. And it was really stressful. And I would always get sick during that time because you mm. know, there's so much anxiety on you. But to have that balance in your life where you can be like, I am pursuing something outside of the sport. So when I do retire, I at least have some sort of like network or, you know, idea of what I want to pursue and I'm not completely, you know, left out. Yeah. I mean, I think when, like, this was something that was ingrained in my family for as long as I can remember, you know, the phrase that we used to say was, you know, in the phrase student athlete, student comes first for a reason because my priority and my, you know, my focus was really on my academics because I think at the end of the day, like I knew that I wanted to do something beyond skating, even if it was something to a professional career. It just wasn't something that I wanted to do full time for the rest of my life. And I also knew the chance of getting injured. Like I was also very injury prone. And so I knew that, you know, my career could really end at any point if I had kind of a, a career ending injury or something came up to that effect. Um, and so, you know, school was always a priority. And that's, you know, obviously why I kind of carried that through all of my skating years, even though I got a lot of flack for that for many people. And um, you know, I, at the end of the day, like, I'm super grateful that I did that because if I hadn't, I wouldn't be where I am now. Like I wouldn't be in a graduate program, you know, pursuing something that I really love and affecting change in the sports community in different ways than, uh, than I would have if I had stayed in for, um, you know, probably longer, I guess. I just wanted to, yeah, I just, I wanted to pursue different things and, you know, even going back to your point about retiring young age, like I had a retirement party when I was 21 years old, you know, <laughs> like that in and of itself is hilarious. And so now I like to joke that 
I'm on career number two, you know, being in grad school and, and pursuing a PhD in clinical psychology and either going into academic research or you know, the, the clinical side, you know, I'm still figuring that piece out a little bit, but I'm just very, very grateful that I made the decisions that I did to um, help me put myself in this position. Yeah, it is true that, you know, your career bases off like your body and if you don't take care of your body right or you know you can be taking your taking care of your body perfectly and then an injury happens that you have no control over and so it is kind of unfortunate to say that like nothing is guaranteed you do need to you know put everything you can into yourself but then into other things that you're passionate about and like when my partner first retired in 2018 I was like okay well do I want to try and see if there's someone else out there for me and like keep pushing, even though I feel like I'm not going to be able to accomplish as much as I have already, or should I pursue all my other passions? And I was like, I think at this point, there's so much more that I want to do outside of this realm, Mm -hmm. even to improve the sport in itself. I mean, I'm studying kinesiology. I want to help athletes, you know, recover, train as best that they can and be someone for them that, you know, I didn't have for myself. And Same with these series. I just want to improve the athletic community. And I think it's best to do that at this point in my life from the outside in rather than, you know, continue within the sport and see everything around and be like, I want to make a change, but I just don't even have the qualifications to do so at this point. Mm. Yeah. I mean, that makes a lot of sense for sure. Yeah. And did you, while you were skating, did you ever seek out the help of any professionals? Oh, yeah. Um, Many, you know, from the sports psychology side to the nutrition side to uh, strength and conditioning. You know, I I think one thing that was so wonderful about my parents being very strong advocates throughout my career was they were really coming at this from a holistic approach. And so they knew that, you know, we couldn't just focus on the coaching time that I was getting on the ice. Like that is one piece of this for sure. But at the end of the day, that's, that's only so much of the work that you can accomplish and you can only take so many hours on the ice every day. You know, it it makes sense to kind of, uh, take, take, um, Uh, an eagle eye view, if you will, and make sure that you're addressing some of the concerns from every aspect. So um, yeah, I worked with sports psychologists over the years, Um, worked with a nutritionist uh, through USOP or through the Olympic Training Centers and elsewhere. Um, But yeah, it was, it was wonderful getting like such a wealth of information from these folks because I'm, you know, very data driven and which I guess I really come by honestly, because both my parents are researchers (laughs) And now look what I'm doing with my, you know, with my career, um, you know, in, in research. And I love having that type of information and that education so that when we're making decisions, we feel really informed um, about the best path forward, uh, even if it is uncertain, you know, due to the international season or, you know, an international pandemic or, you know, whatever kind of comes your way. You just have to be flexible and work with the best information possible. So, yeah, I loved having kind of a multi multidisciplinary team. Yeah. Did you find that you were eager to reach out for help or it was something that you had to kind of convince yourself that, I need an outside source for, you know, that certain perspective. I struggle with asking for help and I still struggle with that sometimes, <laughs> still working on that. Um, so I think I had to rely on my parents a little bit more and like my coaches to some extent to say, okay, like we know you're really struggling. Like let's, let's figure out how else we can, address this concern because obviously what we're doing right now isn't isn't working Mm -hmm. um so let's let's either talk with someone else or get a little bit more information um so i'm very very grateful that they were able to take that role but i also had to learn how to say i'm struggling i need some additional help on this like that was that was a level of communication that i had to learn um later on in my career especially like I don't know, like late high school and college, like when I was, you know, having to do all of this on my own and commuting around the Bay Area from Oakland down to San Jose to Los Gatos, back to Palo Alto all in one day to get adequate training time and physical therapy, you know, and, and getting all the services that I need. So yeah, it was, 
it was not um, an easy thing for me to do because personally, I like to be very independent and I like to be able to do things <laughs> on my own terms. And, you know, I take a lot of pride in that. Um, however, it is so important to like have people on your team and have people support you. And so once I kind of figured that out, <laughs> which is like, oh yeah, duh, of course. Um, once I figured that out, I was like, okay, you know, I, I need to be able to speak up and say, look, this is, this is either the problem that I'm having and the specific solution that I need, or, you know, I'm coming to you for help because I don't know how to solve this. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a challenge and I'm still working on that to some extent, but I've gotten a lot better. Um, but yeah, it's, I think that's, that's kind of ingrained in a lot of lead athletes too. It's really hard to share that you need help and it sometimes is perceived as weakness. And, um, you know, that's obviously something that we're trying to change a lot, especially on the mental health piece, like being able to share the fact that you need some help and being able to seek services for those things are hugely important to not only your sports career, but just like your general, general well-being as a human. Um, so that's something that I think we're, you know, actively trying to address. And, you know, the more people can speak out about their, their concerns or how they sought help when they needed it, or just kind of their overall resilience, um, those are really important stories to share yeah, I do feel like there's this new wave coming of, you know, girls that are coming out about issues that they've been facing. And I have a lot of people reaching out to me saying, like, maybe you can talk to this person because I didn't even know that they were struggling because we keep it so internalized. And same with a lot of the athletes that I have spoken on my series already. They've mentioned that one of the things that stands in their way is the feeling that other people in their rink are also their competitors. So if you do want to ask someone for help, they either don't feel like they can come to their coach because their coach is going to be like, I don't have time for this or, you know, not really take the information in. And then the girls around them who, you know, should be their companions, their friends, you, you're going through essentially the same things. They feel like it's too much of still that competitive aspect of like, if I come to you and express interest um, about either like, are you okay? You've lost a lot of weight recently. Like, I just want to make sure everything's fine that the other person is going to perceive it as you're jealous i'm doing better than you and they're not going to actually like take in that so i think that's a really interesting point because when i was a skater i never really thought about that and it kind of concerns me that like other people may have perceived it that way because in my mind i'm like we're friends i mean we're around each other all the time but are we really so i think that's a really interesting point that a lot of people are bringing up hmm. Yeah, I mean, that I think to to some extent for me that signals, yeah, this is a, skating and other sports obviously have kind of this independent quality when you are the only person on your team, when you're the only person competing. Um, and so I, I can see how that might play into it to some extent. Um, you know, we're all vying for similar spots on, you know, Team USA or on an international, for an international event or whatever the case may be. And, you know, sometimes that competitiveness can kind of get in the way of being supportive, I guess. Um, so for me that, you know, that perspective makes a lot of sense. I think in my own experience, you know, we had, we had a really good group when I was training in class, a really good group of, of athletes that were all, like, we were all good buddies. And I think when we were struggling, we were able to say, like, look, this is kind of what's going on. Um, you know, even if it was just to say, yeah, I feel you, I'm right there with you. Um, but in hindsight, like, now getting some of my clinical training, I realized some of those conversations, like, I wish... I had certain communication skills and I wish I had more information and education on like, if someone is having some sort of mental health concern, here's really how you should approach that kind of a conversation. Like, here's how to reach out to them. Here's how to express that you're concerned. Um, you know, here are the types of resources or, or the people that you should be directing them to. And again, you know, I was, I was a teenager and, you know, I don't want to like, have to place that burden on others who are in that same kind of position and at the same time this is just kind of um you know a 
global reckoning to some extent, you know, mental health concerns are really becoming a, a top priority across the world, especially with the pandemic and all that's going on right now. It's just, you know, mental health concerns are really coming to the forefront and being able to reach out to folks, share your support and help them get the, the information or the resources or the treatment that they need. Like that's a big uh, component to what's going on in the world and also just what's going on in sports right now. So I think there's a lot of room for, you know, there's a lot of opportunities to help improve that process and to establish more education and more or more research even because we don't even have a lot of research to that extent um, on how to do that super well. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities to improve it systemically. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm very excited to, you know, hopefully be part of that, at least within my, you know, my own little community at this point. But yeah, it's, it's definitely something that we're working on to address. Yeah, it's, it's for sure a slippery slope when, you know, you're a friend and you're talking to your teammates and someone does say something that can be triggering. And then you're like, well, as a friend, you usually, you know, agree with them. You're like, oh yeah, I'm so sorry. Like, you're right. It's hard to change that like mentality of being like, no, actually like you do have a problem and like how to say that so that they're not feeling like you're attacking them. So that's what I think that's the best part of speaking to a psychologist or a clinician is that they have the education and how to respond to you. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's great if you have friends that can support you and you feel like you can open up to, but they're not going to be able to help you make a change. They can help you feel better potentially, but for a long-term solution, I think it's better to reach out to someone who's professionally trained in that and really knows the science behind how to you know, deal with what you're facing. 100% agree with you. Like that's what those professionals are in their places for. Like they have that education, they have the many years of experience, you know, they understand like what specifically to validate and what types of skills to put in place when certain problems arise. Um, you know, that that's like the educational piece that they received. And so, you know, it's really important to use those folks in those instances and to make sure that, you know, if you are a peer and you realize someone else is struggling, or, you know, trying to get someone to seek help, like encouraging them to do that, you know, sharing some of those observations that, hey, I recognize that you, you know, maybe aren't feeling yourself. I just want to check in and see how you're doing. And, you know, if anything more serious comes up, that's like a great opportunity to say, wow, you know, I, you know, I know someone else who has sought services for a similar kind of problem, or, you know, you can go to, for eating disorders, like you can go to the National Eating Disorders Association website and say, look, you know, the, they can help you find a professional in your area, like right now. Um, so being able to kind of facilitate those conversations in that way is like so meaningful. But again, like you want to leave the, the treatments and the prevention work to the export or to the experts. <laughs> yeah. And what was it that drew you into getting a PhD in psychology? <laughs> well, now that I'm in year three, I'm like, wait, why did I do this again? <laughs> uh, no, I'm, I'm loving it. It's just a lot of work. Third yeah. year is notoriously the, the hardest in our program, just with all the hats that we're wearing. Um, no, I honestly was going to go to medical school up until like, a couple days after I graduated from college, um, submitted my first round of uh, applications for med school and with very applications because I was like, this is just not what I want to do. Um, so it, it was a challenging time to say the least because it was really, I was um, you know, I just graduated, decided not to go to medical school and like really was finally dealing with the fact that I was no longer skating. So that was like the trio that really did me in and I was struggling for quite a while. It was probably the roughest year I've ever had. And um, that was the time where I started doing a little bit more research with the uh, with the research advisor that I had during my senior year in college. And we were predominantly focusing on uh, an eating disorder intervention that was being disseminated across 28 universities nationally. And so I was just helping out with that a little bit and some of the other projects that was that were kind of coming across this table and um, realized that I actually was super interested 
interested in digital mental health tools and being able to disseminate you know, these high quality evidence-based resources to folks who maybe haven't had access to mental health care before, or they just couldn't afford it, or you know, whatever the case may be, they just hadn't been able to get services. And so, um, yeah, that to me was just such a big draw. And I realized how much mental health and wellness played in my career as a skater and also just generally as a human, like my daily functioning was always really impacted by how I was feeling and my mood and, you know, just overall mental health. So, um, yeah, so I, I realized like, wow, this is a place where I feel like I could have an enormous impact. And then for some reason, it took me a little bit of time, but the dots connected. And I was like, wow, we need to do this in sports. Like we need to have this kind of a focus, not just on the mental side of performance, but really on the clinical side and addressing these underlying mental health concerns. And so, you know, knowing kind of the prevalence of, or the high prevalence of eating disorders and mental health concerns in skating and other sports, especially that have like some sort of aesthetic focus, I was like, oh my gosh, I can't not do this. Like this is, this feels like I'm now obligated to do this to some extent, but I love it. I'm having so much fun. And you know, I'm working my butt off, like I'm still learning and I'm, you know, halfway through my grad school experience. And so I still have a little bit to go, but yeah, I just, I, that's kind of how I got into the grad school sphere. It was just, I knew the types of credentials that I would need to affect change on the level that I wanted to. And so that's kind of what brought me here. Nice. Yeah, it's, I feel like you get a better perspective when you're outside of the sport, because <laughs> when you're in it, you're so overwhelmed with all the stuff that you have to focus on. And I think it's like a sad truth. But when you're inside of that community, it's so normalized to be facing with those kinds of problems. And I, I know constantly, all the girls would be like, Oh, I'm not eating this. I'm vegan this week. Like, how many calories are you having? And it's just like, the common locker room conversations and then when you go outside and really learn about the like science behind that you're like oh that's a problem like i was reading about the female triad and then the first sport that came up was figure skating and i was like i'm not surprised like that that makes so much sense to me and then that's where i was like there really is a problem because even outside sources are seeing it but we're so like captivated with you know, the sport and training so hard that we, we lose focus of what our real attention should be on. And I think a lot of times optimal performance takes the number one, but in order to reach optimal performance, you have to take care of your health. Mm -hmm. Really striving for optimal health should be that top priority, but we kind of get like blindsided. And I think that's the really great thing I hope like you can help create and you know, all the other athletes that are now also pursuing science um, professions is we have that unique perspective of being in it and that relatability and we can build rapport and, you know, figure out how to create that change from this whole other side of things. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's truly evidence-based work. And I completely agree in that, you know, Unfortunately, not, it's not just in skating, but unfortunately, a lot of these behaviors and, um, you know, fad diets and those are normalized, not only within skating, but other sports and also just within our general community. Like we hold ourselves to these totally unrealistic body standards, um, which now, of course, being on the opposite end and having retired, you know, six years ago now, it's just like, oh gosh, what, you know, why, why was I so beholden to that? And, um, you know, I can question that all day long and beat myself up for it. But at the end of the day, like that was the experience that I had, um, just because I didn't have the normal physique or quote unquote normal physique, um, for the elite skater, the typical elite skater. Um, and you know, I got a lot of flack for it and I, you know, I will remember certain comments that people have said to me for years and years and years. I'll probably never forget them. And, but at the end of the day, like that's the culture that we're trying to change. And I, you know, for me, it's so inspiring to see so many other people like actively pursuing other careers beyond, um, you know, beyond sport once they retire. And, you know, it's not to say that you, 
can't stay in the sport and have a really valuable impact because honestly I'm working with some folks who are in that space and they're just freaking amazing you know they're like just doing a great job and you know for me as also like a woman in science I just love uplifting like other women who are doing the same thing and pursuing that so you know it really speaks to both sides of the coin and it's just such an awesome experience to be a part of a lot of the work that's being done right now um, because I'm just able to interact with so many professionals who are just you know such masters of their crafts and uh, are able to really start implementing some changes that are not just band-aids to the problem. It's like really starting to change the culture uh, in sports and in mental health care more broadly. So it's it's been, you know, unique to have both of those experiences and kind of hold the the sport experience and now like the the um, you know, grad school clinical psych PhD doing the research, doing the clinical work, like being able to really integrate those viewpoints is just so much fun. <laughs> well, I'm really excited for you. That sounds amazing. And within that, you said a really good point how some comments you're going to remember, you know, for the years to come. And a lot of times I feel like the point that we're skating is like a blink of an eye in our entire lives. I mean, it's like what, 10 to 20 years. That's, that's really not a lot. And within that time you think that that's like this is the biggest thing i'm ever going to accomplish this is like the most important this is all that matters i'm going to put everything i can in this point and you know i'm not really thinking about the future and sometimes those comments come into play because people are you know so there's so much pressure on you and they're putting so much into you and then they say some things and they don't realize that those words have impacts beyond this one point in your life and so mm -hmm. Whereas during this time as an athlete, you may be struggling and they're like, it's fine. Like I can just tell them whatever now, but they can finish retire in their sport and still continue to struggle with those issues and have trouble fighting them and, you know, building the rest of their lives because that one thing that someone said is still engraved in their mind and they just can't shake it off. And I think that's also a really great thing about even for coaches to have some education in psychology and how to say things properly because a lot of times they're giving you feedback and their main goal is just to help you out, but it's the way that things are said that might come off a little bit wrong and can have a much greater impact on an athlete than they could have ever foreseen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree in that, again, providing more education to the kind of the first line caretakers of athletes, whether it is a coach, an athletic trainer, sports med physician, you know, whoever is kind of that first line of care um, and interact with athletes the most like those are the folks that really need to understand how their comments can influence uh, the athlete you know both in the short term and the long term and so you know that's why there's so many great programs like mental health first aid that you know a lot of um, sports med practitioners and coaches are starting to take so that they one can identify like certain you know signs and symptoms of mental health issues and two like be able to have educated conversations and again like being able to express like i'm concerned about you i want to support you like here's here's the next step here's how we get you to the appropriate level of care that you might need or at least like encouraging them to go see a physician or some sort of mental health care provider to get an evaluation like just again getting more information so that you're addressing the issues holistically and that the appropriate providers are addressing like the appropriate concerns um that's just that's a total game changer when it comes to being an elite athlete and so yeah i i, I am in whole you know in complete support of of that and i think that's something that a lot of folks are trying to address like not only within olympic level sports but also like at the collegiate level and yeah. um you know even to some extent at the grassroots level too so it's really inspiring to see those changes and i think for me like when i you know when i look back in my career in 20 30 years like i hope that i can be a part of that process as well and i hope that i can be a part of that change because i think that is just a really meaningful um an impactful space yeah i was talking to carrie afric mm -hmm. about her this program that she's trying to design with helping educate you know coaches officials mm -hmm. athletes parents about you know some of the nutritional aspects of being an athlete 
And I think it's so incredible if it can be done because I think that is like the last missing key because everything just comes down to education. I mean, you can have the best, um, the best intentions, but if you don't know what you're saying or how you're saying it, that's going to, at the end of the day, be the biggest impact. So I'm really hoping that she can help create that soon. But I was actually very surprised when she said that it's only her and one other dietitian who are contracted that are trying to build on that. So it would be great, you know, once you finish your PhD, I'm sure that you would have some like incredible insight and just trying to bring in as m the greatest amount of people to help build that program up because I think that would be, you know, a great next step to help create change for all athletes, girls and boys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, part of me is like, okay, so when is this PhD ending? <laughs> so I could like get out into the real world and do all this stuff that I want to do. And, you know, obviously with the limited amount of time or spare time that I have, uh, you know, to, to pitch in wherever I can is, is awesome. But yeah, at the end of the day, it's unfortunately somewhat limiting to still be in grad school and, <laughs> and trying to do all these things. Um, but yeah, I, I agree. Like any sort of education that we provide on, you know, this standpoint is awesome. I actually wrote a continuing education course for, um, for uh, the Professional Skaters Association on, on body image and helping to prevent eating disorders. And one of the pieces that we did talk about was like how to communicate with your athletes if you're concerned. Um, we actually like put together a cute little video for it as well, which was really fun. It was like, could we put it together a couple of years ago and I had to practice like how to be a clinician before, you know, I had any of that training. So it was like a really good experience for me to like think through like those types of conversations. And obviously this was all supervised by, you know, someone who has that kind of credential. So, uh, and then my current PI or my current PhD co-wrote all of the material with me. Um, so at the time it was just, you know, amazing to work with her before I had started grad school. And, you know, she just had so many fantastic little nuggets of information and, you know, it was, it was a group effort. We had a number of folks who were helping out on that course, but yeah, it's just really wonderful to be a part of those types of experiences and those types of, um, you know, educational points because not every, you know, not every sport has um, access to that. And so I'm just very grateful to like be working on this stuff. Yeah. And what is one piece of advice that you would have for any skaters that may be watching this and, you know, resonate with what we're talking about? Hmm. So something that I'm learning right now a lot in my clinical rounds is really helping folks understand that it is not a product of your environment and is not just one thing that kind of leads to an eating disorder or any other mental health concern. Like it is a product of your genes. It is a product of your family history and your environment. All of the things that you've been exposed to throughout your lifetime, like it is really a product of all those things. And, um, you know, it's not like that person's fault. Like it is, like I hope for them, it alleviates a little bit of um, kind of the shame and the guilt associated with a lot of mental health concerns. And secondly, you know, if you are experiencing any any struggles, any challenges, anything that you're concerned about, like please, please seek help. Like please reach out to someone who you trust and someone who is in a position to say, okay, let's let's get you to these resources, whether that's a parent or a coach or you know, and, you know, someone who, who you trust. Um, sometimes it could even be a friend, you know, if that's really the person that you say, I, I need help, like I need you to help me get there. Um, so please don't feel um, like you can't do that because even though it's really scary, like that's the first step. That's the, that's the biggest step that you need to take. So yeah, those are kind of my two, my two take homes. <laughs> And I'm sure, you know, this will be revised in the next year or, you know, next couple of years. But yeah, that's, that's kind of where my head's at right now. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much again. I had a great time talking with you and I feel like I learned a lot and hopefully, you know, our conversation can help out some of the skaters out there who, you know, are struggling.
Yeah, me too. And thank you so much for, you know, one, inviting me on this, but two, just for helping to really identify and highlight some of these, you know, some of these experiences in sport, because this is something that I think a lot of people with, and, you know, we just want to try and make this better together. Yeah, absolutely.